I titled this Educating Security a new, Needs a New Approach. Um, as you can see, I have binaries. I gave this talk back at uh, Besides Cleveland, and I called it um, Step Away from the Binary. So that's where the origin of the binaries are here. And actually, I kept that title included in here because I think it says a lot about what I'm trying to convey. And I think that as we go through this, hopefully you'll see what I'm saying and you'll, get it, you'll understand the, the definition behind stepping away from the binaries and how that relates into educating security. I have to give the warning that the views expressed here are mine and mine alone. They do not represent my friends, families, coworkers, employers, or any other person who may or may not know me. This is entirely my own madness, um, which I drew some information from my wife, but the madness is my own. So I've put the warning out there. Um, if you want to leave now so you don't become as mad as I am, you may. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I like to do that through a tag cloud. So Ghost Nomad, obviously, is, is my identity on Twitter and online. Um, started a long time ago. I'm, a, I'm obviously a geek. Hopefully, I'm obviously a geek. Some people didn't think I was when they first met me, but uh, they learned pretty quickly that maybe I was. Now, Chris is in the room, so I know he'll heckle me on this. I was an auditor at one point. Well, <laughs> okay, so, so I spent 14 years as an auditor. I've been in less than a year in InfoSec. So I mean, that's, it's a little bit bolder, but not as bold as some of the other things. But being an auditor did play into um, some of the background information I have in this talk because I got to see some things. And I'll go into that in just a little bit. Being a husband is very important to this talk, though. My wife is a... Um, school neuropsychologist. What that means is that she's done a lot of classes and a lot of work in not only school psychology, but also in understanding how the brain functions and works. And I've really taken a lot of her work, what she's done the past five, six years in her school district, in implementing a different approach to dealing with kids with um, special needs and even just minor learning disabilities, and try to take that from the educational point of view and put it into the business point of view. And so that's why being a husband is, is bold here. Also being a father, this morning I gave a talk with my son Ghost Nomad Jr. here. And being a father, I can watch the way my kids learn. And I can see the way they pick things up and the way they do things. And so it's kind of cool for me because I can reconnect with the way that they learn and, and apply that to how I can learn and how other people can learn. And you know, if I can give them the information, a lot of times your kids are like, oh, dad's helping me with my homework and not mom. And that's usually bad when it's math. Otherwise, I'm usually okay. So being a father plays a big part in learning about education and how we can take that to the next step. I also do some blogging. I tend to write some haiku from time to time. And I try to relate um, real world events to information security. I may not always be successful. I'm always willing for your feedback on that. But that's kind of what I blog about. I'm an avid reader, uh, carpenter. That actually played a big part prior to coming into um, getting my college degree. I was a painter and a carpenter. And I think a lot of things that you learn in the trades also can help you as you go along. And if you've never worked in the trades, that's not a slam against you. It's just you do end up learning a lot of things about the way people learn and also the way people deal with other people rather interesting. Um, I'm recently becoming a, a somewhat uh, able cook. I used to only be able to cook five or six things, and I'm trying to expand that out. But again, it's all about learning new things as opposed to just staying with the status quo. So I get a lot of flack since I gave my talk at Nauticon last year about haiku. So I'm going to start this one off with a haiku. It's called Just a Box, Designed to Protect, Must Configure Properly, Otherwise Useless. I think this is probably pretty true. I mean, you can put a box in your system to protect you, but if you don't design it properly, if you don't set up the, the controls in it properly, it's just a box. You've pretty much just wasted 15 grand on something that you can't do anything with. So that takes us back to the binaries. <laughs> We're back to the binaries. What does binaries have to do with education? Well, in the education systems, we send our kid in to the black box. And, and yes, I did draw these stick figures, so I do apologize. But we send our kids into this black box. And when they, at the end of it, we know they come out with this degree, this diploma. They have the hat, 
we're all happy because the system worked. And we don't really think about what happened within that system. But within that system, there's a pass-fail. It's either you pass or fail, right? That's the binary. So when you think about education in a binary sense, we know they come out with a diploma. What happened in between may not matter to us as parents because they have their diploma. It may matter to a business because they may say, well, what's your GPA? What courses did you take? But again, it's not really about what and how they learned. It's about the diploma that they come out with. And also, the other thing is that when you talk about the traditional scenario, there's a, there's a, a population that comes out of here without that diploma or that gets that diploma, but it's not as easy to get. And that's where the school psychologist comes into play. And the traditional role of a school psychologist in schools is, my kid's having problems. He can't understand the teacher, what she's saying. He takes the notes, but he never passes the test. And so we send him to a school psychologist, because obviously there's a problem in the way that he's learning. And the school psychologist goes, tests him, puts a label on him, gets him into the special classes he needs, and maybe he or she comes out with a diploma, maybe not. But we really look at it as a black box. Now, before we can talk about education and educating security, we need to take a look at intelligence. And I did take this, uh, this um, bell curve off of Wikipedia just for proper attribution. But when we think about the business environment, we want to think that everybody that we work with is smart, right? I mean, we're all in. We got the job. We got through the hiring process. We have to be intelligent people. And so if we're working with intelligent people, they should get what we're telling them, right? I mean, it should be easy. We hand you a paper. It says the requirements, and you should get it. But when we look at intelligence on the bell curve, 68% of people are within one standard deviation of the normal range. So 68% of our population, whether it's business or just out in the world, lands within normal say normal in air quotes because nothing's really normal. But from an intelligence standpoint, 68% of us are there. Now, on either side of that standard deviation, there's another 13%, a second deviation away, down or up. And so you've got another 27%. So roughly over 90% of the population falls within one standard or two standard deviations of normal. And so from a business perspective, we're not just taking the top crust. We're not just taking that, even that 2.5% or that 13%. We're probably going all the way down to two standard deviations below normal. Because two standard deviations below normal isn't necessarily a bad thing when you talk about intelligence. We also have to understand what intelligence is and what it isn't. Um, I didn't know this, and this is something that I learned from my wife, but intelligence is what your capability is. So this is how much you can achieve. And the second thing, I use the word achieve there, the second thing is, what are you achieving? And so in a school setting, if your intelligence is 110, so you're up in that, up around that 13.6% on the top of the bell curve, but your achievement is at an 80, there's a problem there. You're not achieving your potential. And so intelligence, as it relates to an IQ, is just your potential. And that's your potential in the learning environment that has been designed. Because those tests, those intelligence tests, have to be normed. And they're normed on students in the educational system. And so when you have that gap between achievement and IQ, that's when you have what's called, um, those are your special education kids. Those are your kids that have a learning disability. Now, special education doesn't mean you're emotionally disturbed. That's a, that's a population. It can mean something simple as, I sit here and I read a piece of paper. And that what I read doesn't go into my brain. Because I have a process that's not working between my eyes and my brain. It could be just that I need to have that verbally communicated to me. I can get it the same way you can. But I'm not taking it in because I'm just reading it. And so that leads to the fact that we're all unique learners. Now, we're talking about kids with special education and identified in schools. But what we don't talk about are the people that get missed. 
and that's a large population. You know, if, if you want to talk about the kids that are identified, you're, you're below probably 20% that actually get identified in your schools. But there's still a large number of people. If you think about a grading scale between A and F, there's kids that get A's, there's kids that get, get B's, C's, and D's. And from A to D, you've passed. F, you've failed. So even though we have a grading system that goes A to F, there's four chances for you to pass. So it may not seem like it's a binary thing, but it actually is. And so being unique learners means that we need to be able to adjust not just to the A students, not just to the A and B students, but to all those students that have the ability and the, the achievement to learn. So I'm going back to the binaries again, because at this point I want to step away from the binaries. And so we have our student, little kid. He's all ready to go, all ready to go to school, right? I mean, kids love school. And what I've done here is I've peeled back the black box portion of the school. So now we can start to see some things that may be in the school that instead of just going through the black box, now we're going to take a look at how some of these unique learners maybe get through it. And so some of the work that my wife has done over the last five to six years has revolved around the idea of response to intervention. Um, again, like I told you, the school psychologist's previous role was to test in place. A kid's identified, send them to the psychologist, they test them, they place them, everything's good, right? Well, what about those kids that have somewhat of a gap in achievement to IQ, but not enough to be identified? Because that was the typical model. Well, what response to intervention's goal is to do is to say, we've got this range of people that could really benefit from a modification of the way we teach. But we're not doing it. We're only selecting a few kids to get some help. And so the components of response to intervention are to identify, which obviously is to identify areas that we're having issues, to monitor, and I'll come back to that because that's in the middle here, but it, it's important that we come back to that, and intervene. Your intervention doesn't just mean an intervention like, you know, someone's having a problem and they don't want to recognize it, and so you have to sit them down and say, you have a problem. No. This intervention is taking action to help them learn. Where the monitoring comes in is you can identify a problem, you can intervene into the problem, but if you don't monitor what's happening with that intervention, you can't adjust if the kid's learning or not. And this also applies to business. If we're identifying areas that we need to um, instruct people in and then giving them that intervention, giving them that training, if we don't go back and monitor the success of our training, we've failed. Because, and again, if not, well, I'm not talking about pass or fail monitoring. I'm talking about actually monitoring how much you've taken in. And the reason why we failed is because we could say that, well, 90% of the people passed it, so we, we succeeded. But what's the range of the passing? Again, A to D. You know, did people just pass? Did people really pass? And those people that didn't pass, why didn't they pass? Was it because maybe we just handed them a manual and said read it and then signed the certificate that says you passed it? Or is it because they couldn't get from reading the manual what they needed to, but had you sat them down in the class, maybe they would have gotten it? And so that brings us to a three-tier model. And this is probably the most interesting thing I found about the response to intervention rule, is that you don't just set up an intervention based on one level playing field. You have to have a progression. And so at tier one, this is our general intervention. If you're talking about schools, what this is is, okay, we know that kids have a problem reading and, and comprehending. So maybe instead of just pulling two kids out for tutoring, we work with the whole class. We give them tools that you know, can help them with their reading comprehension. And so maybe just by doing that one simple change in the classroom, we've affected a lot of students, and maybe we don't have to go to the next level. So if you're thinking about this in the, in the sense of an information security um, educational system, this is your general training. Call everybody into a room, give them your training, and you know you hope that everybody does well. 
Then you move on to tier two. This is your specialized tier. Now, again, you've, you've gone through that first phase. If you've monitored the success, you know who has kind of sifted out through that. And so maybe now you're down to 20% of the people didn't quite get what you're trying to get them to understand. And so you pull them as a smaller group. And now maybe this is where, in a classroom setting, you've, you've done the general intervention to the kids. Now you're going to pull maybe five or six kids over for a little bit of extended reading time. Maybe you do this during recess. Maybe you um, do it at other times. And I, I can think back to when I was in school, and maybe you can too, when um, you know, those kids would always get pulled off into a special room. You know, and that was the special room. Whether they were talented and gifted or whether they had learning disabilities, you knew the kids that were getting pulled away. And so the specialized tier, yeah, you're pulling them away, but at least you haven't identified them right off the bat. At least you've gone through the process of trying to deal with it before you go to this next level. Because labeling in schools is much like labeling in life, and I'm sure information security people and technology people are used to being called things like geek, nerd, bookworm, auditor. <laughs> you know, all those labels that we have to live with that um, can be hurtful sometimes, and we learn to get past it. But when you think about being in a workplace environment, some people may have gotten through their life without those, those, those labels. And so now all of a sudden you've branded them a failure because you've done an educational system for information security that's on that binary level. So specialized, we're trying to avoid getting to this level, but you know they're going to fall out to that. And, but you don't want to make it to the extent that you've labeled these people. So you don't want to go out and call out and say, hey, you know, you didn't do good on this first test, so you've got to come back in. We need to remediate you. We need to fix you. You don't want to take that kind of approach. And that goes back to my auditor days when I had to write reports. And notoriously, and Chris can vouch because he's now an auditor, <laughs> that you're going to find something. I mean, you can't do everything perfect all the time. So your auditor is always going to find something. And if I walked into a client and said, you're doing it wrong, they're going to look at me, glaze over, and move on. So what you have to do is you have to kind of finesse it. And so in this case, if you're working in a business environment, what you want to say is, we need you to come in because we, we think we've identified you as a person who could benefit from further training. And so you're not quite you know, uh, marginalizing these people yet. And then tier three, this is your intensive level. So you've gone through that general intervention. You've tried to help the whole class. You've tried to help the whole group. You've identified those people that didn't quite get it, but could benefit from a little bit more. And you've done that specialized. And now you've down to the intensive. This is where you do the one-on-one. -on -one. So you know, this is the kid that maybe you pull for individual tutoring sessions. And then maybe this is the point where you say, OK, you know what? We, we've really tried a lot of things. And we haven't tried to label you yet. But maybe now it's time to send you to the school psychologist and actually have you identified and get you the help that you need. Because in schools, at least in the US, you don't get funding for special education unless you've been identified. So you'll find a lot of times that in, in the school environment, people may be resistant to this process because it doesn't give them the funding that they need to do what they need. But maybe with just a little finesse, you can get those things in integrated into the normal situations without that funding. Um, and so again, the intensive. So if in a business environment, this is where you've done that first step. You've done the next step. And now you're calling the person in individually and saying, OK, how can we help you to understand this? Because obviously, the methods that we've used aren't working. Just because somebody doesn't get something doesn't mean it's their fault. Again, going back to that unique learner. Just because you go through school with a reading disability and graduate, and then you go on to college with a reading disability and graduate, doesn't mean the day you walk into a business, you don't have a reading disability anymore. You carry that through your whole life. Now, maybe you've learned the techniques to deal with it in school, but you're going to carry that throughout your life. And so for us to say, well, you don't get it because you just don't get it. I mean, this isn't easy. This isn't hard. This should be easy. You know, going back to that ideal of um, IQ, 
and, it's, and we put it on them instead of looking at the process that we use to educate them. And so that leads into this whole idea of progress monitoring. And this is at the core of response to intervention. You can do everything you want to do to identify people and to um, intervene with them. But if you aren't monitoring the progress, and this isn't their progress, this essentially becomes your progress, then you have a system that's going to fail you every time. Now, progress monitoring, the idea here is that you're not giving a test. We, we love tests in school. And again, going back to the binary system, you either pass a test or you fail a test. There's degrees of passing, but it's pass or fail. The same thing happens um, in, with the Ohio, I know Ohio has the Ohio graduation test. You either pass the Ohio graduation test or you don't. And what that means is that you either get a diploma as, as a person who passed the Ohio graduation test, or you get a diploma that says, well, you've, you've met all the requirements except for passing that test. So there's, it's a two-tiered approach to diplomacy at, at the high school level. And so again, you're, even though you're passing, there's degrees of passing, there's still pass or fail. And so when you, when you have the idea of a test, you get to the point of teaching to the test. You know, teachers want to teach the students what they need to know to pass that test. Because those performance indicators of who's passing and who's failing comes back to them. And so instead of in progress monitoring, the concept isn't to test people of what they know. It's to assess people, assess people of what they know. So the, the trick here is that people are going to want to treat it as a test. So you, you give somebody something and say, OK, answer these questions, and, and, and we'll go from there. OK, well, I have to pass this thing, right? So I'm going to pull up my, my notes that I've taken so I can, I can answer these questions properly. When progress monitoring, you don't want to do that. You just want to know what they know at that time. Because what they know should be what they've learned. And if they haven't learned it, that means that you've failed to do what you need to do, which is to educate them on how to do things. Now, it doesn't mean that you're a failure. It just means that you haven't connected with the way that person learns. And so what progress monitoring does is not only does it give us a, a scale of how many people are getting what, but it tells us what each individual is getting and what they're not. And that lets us focus when you talk about going from that general tier, that first tier, to the second tier. <laughs> That allows us to focus what we're teaching them based on what they're not getting. So again, you don't want to just pull people into a small group and say, OK, you guys didn't really do a good job the first time, so here's the stuff again. OK, we've sat with you a second time. No, what you want to do is break up those people into groups of what they got and what they didn't get. And maybe what you're going to find out is that across the board, there's a small range of what people didn't get, and that's good. Because that means at the generalized tier, we've done what we're supposed to do, which is to get that general knowledge to people based on a, on a, on a non-unique way of learning. But maybe what you'll find out is that a group of people didn't get this, a group of people didn't get this, and a group of people didn't get this. Well, now you're not unified in the way that people are learning. So yeah, they've passed, but people aren't getting the different components. And so you need to go back and retool that based on the progress monitoring, and maybe go back to the general, generalized level and say, OK, we know that you guys got this as a, as a degree of passing, but we didn't quite connect with everybody on all levels. And so progress monitoring, again, is, is key to doing this response to intervention because it tells you where your system is working and where it's not. And if we fail to progress monitor, then we've just fallen back to that binary way of pass or fail. And so now that we know how things work and how, how we can try to make things better, we have our graduate and we're happy, right? But at least we know that that graduate has gotten there because we've done the most we can. And maybe the kid who would have gone through the old way who got that C, maybe now we've helped them to enhance that so that maybe they're a little bit more educated than just pass or fail. Maybe they now get it better because we did take time to deal with the whole class and do those interventions as opposed to just focusing on the kids who really needed it. Which is good for business because it means that we have a more, more well-rounded and educated workforce coming in. 
<clears throat> so in business, and this really falls under two categories, education a lot of times equals compliance. Now, the first case has to do with certifications. And I know that uh, a lot of people have issues with certifications and the way they do CPEs. Um, and that's a, that is a true form of education equals compliance. You know, how many people go out and get their driver's license? They take the test once. You get your driver's license, and you never have to take a test again. Now, there's ways you can lose your license. You know, you get points for doing things like running people over with your car and driving too fast and running through buildings with your vehicle. But in essence, you get your driver's license, and unless your eyesight severely degrades or unless your hearing severely degrades, you get to keep that license for the rest of your life. And it's very similar. <laughs> it's very similar to CPEs. <clears throat> There's not a way that we say, okay, you get your CPEs. Now we're going to test the knowledge that you got and how relevant is that to your certification. What we say is, okay, you've gotten CPEs. Did you get them from an accredited organization? And if you did, we just want to make sure that your paperwork's okay. That's that's called an audit. And if you're if your paperwork's okay, you've reached compliance. Now, compliance doesn't equal knowledge, the same way that we like to say that compliance doesn't equal security. And as an auditor auditing governments, education equals compliance is exactly how it's done. Um, the test that we used when I used to audit governments here in Ohio was, did everybody sign the paper that says they read the security policy? That's the security program. Wow. I mean, yeah, exactly. Thumbs up, right? We're good. Everybody read it, right? I mean, nobody would just sign the paper and not read the policy. And nobody would sign the paper if they didn't understand the policy, right? I mean, we're all honest people. And there's no disincentive. Right, exactly. Yeah. Exa exactly. There's no disincentive. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. No. Right, so as an auditor, I check my box, right? Because auditors just do checklists. Yep, I check my box. You are compliant with your security education. I'm happy. And I would move along. And that's how many organizations would do their education program because we're just out to make the regulators and the auditors happy, right? That's the only reason why we do security as education. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the goal? And I was jaded as an, a government auditor, by the way, because governments don't have the resources to do what they're supposed to do. Um, and so it's interesting. When I left government audit to go into the private sector, I saw a whole new world of controls that were actually into place. What's the goal? The goal is to be secure, right? I mean, is the goal to pass or fail security? Hopefully not. Hopefully the goal is to be more secure, right? I mean, that's the goal as a security professional is to impart security. And security doesn't just mean that we know the policy and we're going to comply with it. I hope as information security professionals and information technology, we want security to mean security overall. We can't expect a person to be secure at work and go home and write their passwords for their online banking and their websites on a, on a notepad, right? Because if they're doing it at home, they're going to do it at work. No matter how much we tell them not to, it's just a learned behavior. It's that Pavlov's dog, right? You know, the dog gets rewarded for pushing a button. And so the button is that we've complied with security at work, but then we go home and we're not so secure. So if we really want to be secure, we need to deal with not only making people understand what security is in our organizations, but what security is overall. Interesting point, too, so far we've talked about em, you know, employees that are in organizations. We also have to understand that security expands out to our customer base when we have web-based applications that we're allowing our customers to come into. Because not only does our security depend on internal employees, it also depends on the people that are coming in. We don't know if their systems are infected with malware when they come in. And we don't know what vulnerabilities or what defects we have in our systems that's going to allow that to transfer from the customer <clears throat> into our systems. And not only are they customers, 
but they're probably an employee somewhere. I mean, if they're making money and they're spending it with our organization, then they're, then they're an employee somewhere else. So when we talk about that range of IQ going from all the way to the top down to that second deviation below, we're talking about dealing with not just employees, but also with our customer base. And so if our goal is security, we don't just want to secure the workplace environment, we want to secure the general population. And so how do we do this? Well, first, the step is to design. I mean, we need to design our security program and then put it out there. And so we design and we deliver. And then after we deliver, we need to do that all important step of progress monitoring. And what that means is that we don't give a pass or fail. We assess what our user base has understood the training to be. And if we find out that they didn't get it, we have to refine, which means that we have to go all the way back sometimes to the design phase. You know, and we have to redesign what we're doing. Because again, based on the fact that we're unique learners, the fact that we don't get it isn't necessarily the end user's fault. Sometimes it's the way we've developed the training. And if we're progress monitoring properly, that's gonna help us in our design to make sure that we can cover not just the, the, you know, the top 68 or 72% of learners, but the fact that we're covering a lot more than that. And we deliver again. We go through the cycle, we progress monitor, and then we refine. So it's an ongoing cycle. It can't just be pass or fail. It can't just be a binary way of I've designed it, I've delivered it, I've gotten enough people to pass to be compliant, and now we're good. We need to do this process of going back through and making sure that we're understanding what our end users need and we're making sure that they get what we're trying to ex explain to them. Because without that step, you know, we're only as strong as our weakest point. And so the scenario here is we've just hired a security professional and we know that because he's thinking about O-Day. And I don't think I've beat Relic today on this. I, at B-Size, I beat him on dropping O-Day. And this is how I drop O-Day. No, oh, then I did beat Relic. <laughs> all right, all right. So I did drop O-Day first. This is how I drop O-Day. I'm not savvy enough to develop tools like other people. And so our, our security professional comes into our organization, and we just expect to be secure, right? I mean, we've hired the best. That's all test <laughs> we've, we've hired the best, and now we're secure, right? Well, are we really? Just because we bring someone in to do security doesn't mean that we've made ourselves secure. Because we've got these three things here that are important. People, process, and technology. A lot of times our security professionals focus on the process and the technology. And to some degree, we do that pretty well. You know, it's not always perfect, but we get, we're getting there, right? But we tend to forget about people. You know, people are just kind of out there and we say, okay, we'll, we'll train them, but you know, if we put in the test technology and we put in the process, we can protect the people, right? But maybe the idea isn't that we should be protecting the people. Maybe the people should be taught how to protect themselves. And, and then our technology and processes will become better because our user base is more secure and understanding. Now, I'm not going to say that this type of change is easy. Um, I know my wife has been doing this for five or six years in her district. And if not on a weekly basis, potentially on a daily basis, she's challenged as to this process of response to intervention in the schools. And that's just in the schools. I mean, we're talking about people who want to educate kids. I mean, that's our job, right? Security professionals, we don't go into security to be educators. We go in to be security professionals. And we've gotten there from different walks of life. As I, as I said earlier, I was an auditor. The reason why I was an auditor is because I had a degree in accounting. I mean, I'm not, I'm in information security now, but I didn't get there because I got a technology degree. Um, and so when you talk about educators fighting their own to implement this type of a process, you have to understand that going taking this idea into business is not going to be easy at all. And it's going to be very hard, as I'm sure many of us have already dealt with, just trying to educate business on what security is in general. And so 
I'm not going to tell you that if you do these steps that I've just gone through, it's going to work because it's not, and it's going to take time. But I think if we try to go in and change the thinking slowly and change the way that we do things slowly, I think over time people become more receptive to it. And I got asked a great question in B-Sides about how do you get budget for something that's so nebulous as education, right? Well, that's where your progress monitoring comes in, and you're not going to get funding right away to do this. I mean, it's not going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I get what you're saying. We're going to give you money to do this. What you have to do is kind of do it slowly. You know, start the water at a cool level and slowly turn up the heat and turn up the heat until it's boiling and the person inside the water doesn't get it. You know, you need to start with a small program. You know, try to roll it out. Start to gather data as to what your, your end users are understanding and not understanding. And then once you have that information gathered, that's when you go back and say, okay, I think we need to change the way we're doing things. I don't want to wholesale just throw away what we're doing, but maybe we can implement a little bit more. And then you go back and you collect that data and you gather more information. And pretty soon it becomes pretty apparent where your weaknesses are and where your strengths are. And it's going to take time. It's not going to be easy. So I started with this, just a box. Designed to protect, must configure properly, otherwise useless. And as I said earlier, this is any technology we put in our system. But now change the way you're thinking about this. And this is a person. A person is designed to protect, but we have to configure them properly. Otherwise, it's useless, right? If we don't give the people the knowledge and the time to understand the knowledge that we're giving them, what we're doing is useless. We haven't achieved anything more than to just roll out a compliance program. And so we can't just think of these things as in terms of technology. Even though at, at, on the top when I wrote this, this was about technology, as I wrote this for B-Sides, I thought, wow, this is also about people. Because if we don't give them the proper configuration, if we don't give them the proper knowledge, they can't help us be secure as security professionals. And this morning in my talk with, with Ghost Nomad Jr., I talked about baking in security at, at the early levels of our lives. And that's so true. I mean, we're bolting on the security at this point in our lives. We've got a lot of people in organizations that cover different generations that didn't grow up with these things, that did grow up with these things. And so not only do we have to bolt it on in our organizations, but we have to really help start at the levels where people aren't even thinking about security yet. You know, it's, it's not something you have to think about, it's just something you do. And so configuring people properly, giving them the proper tools, is really what's the important part of it. And the way we give them those tools is we manage how we're um, performing so that we can make sure that the tools we give them are the proper tools they need. And so if you want to talk to me more about this, obviously I'm here to answer questions, but you can always email me at ghostnomad at ghostnomad.com. I'm on Twitter, ghostnomad. And my two sites, I have uh, ghostnomad.com. That's where I write those things where I take things like, I haven't done it in a while, but I take police reports and try to relate it to information security. And then also, ithaiku.com. That's where I write my haiku. I'm over 620 haiku, I think. I've been laxing lately. I've just taken on too many things, as most people do. Um, I'm really trying hard to get back into it. And, and actually, part of the reason why I haven't been good on this is because I'm, I was encouraged by a few friends to release it as a book. And I'm going to be doing that soon, hopefully. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to write original first chapter, long form haiku, and that's, I've got writer's block. I, I just, I'm failing there. So I'm hoping to get that out in the next month. Um, and it's affecting the haiku out on the, on the page. But uh, I'm still trying to keep up with that. And really the haiku, going back to education and, and haiku, when we talk about the information that we give people, we like to give it in complex terms. We like to give it in our terms. And what haiku has taught me is to simplify what we say. You know, haiku doesn't necessarily mean you get it right away. I mean, we can go back to this one, and you could read this and be like, what are we talking about? 
but at least I'm trying to simplify the words and put it in a short way. And then what, what it will make you want to do is go back to that complexity later on once you get that base knowledge. And so that's really what haiku has taught me as a form of um, communication. So are there any questions? I have yeah, not. You just their model. I, I have not. I'm sure my wife has heard of it. Yeah. Um, and like I said, a lot of the knowledge, I, I, I take a lot of knowledge. My wife comes home with a lot of things and we talk uh, because her stuff is far more interesting than what I do. Mm-hmm. Sure. And, and really, the, it doesn't come, going back to terms of failure, you know, we're, we're taking it as you should either learn this or not, right? Yeah. And, and ultimately, we don't all learn the same way. I mean, that's what, that's what really the goal is here. It's, so, it's so fluffy, but... It's, it's fluffy, but it's true. Yeah. You know, so I can say, well, you know, I have different color hair than you, and, and I have different eye color than you, and that's fluffy, right? But to a degree... Um, some of those things play into your life, right? And so if I, have, if I don't have the ability to read something and take it in and process it properly, it's, I'm not making an excuse for myself. It's that I have a real issue. But I may be able to get by just enough yeah. that I can pass, right? right? I've done the model of pass-fail. Yeah. But I haven't achieved where my potential may be. Right. And so it sounds fluffy, but it, it, at the core... Yeah. I, I, I live with a school psychologist, so <laughs> how does that make you feel? <laughs> sure. Well, yeah, I mean, essentially what you're saying is do, you know, tooling a training to a specific audience as opposed to tooling a training to a general audience, is that... Um, Personally, I'm a person who likes to read something and, and learn that way. I'm, I'm not a big go to a conference person. <laughs> no offense here. <laughs> uh, yes, it's not a con. That's right. And I, and I do attend those. And, and as most people here that attend them, a lot of it's the socialization and the networking. You know, let's meet and, and find common ground. But my personal style is to don't send me to a conference and spend a lot of money on me. Let me get the resources online. Let me try to do it as much as I can on my own. And then if I need that extra boost, then I'll come to you and say that I need it. Um, I, I definitely like the style. I, I do like the way that B-Sides has really structured their stuff because it's very open, very community-based. And so, yeah, if you don't want to go to something, you look at the speaker list and you don't want to go, don't go just because it's a conference. You know, go because there's content that you want there. I don't know if that answers your question. That's what I really like. Plug for Nauticon. That's what I really like about Nauticon is it's so eclectic. Yeah. Would the training and research that are available specifically geared towards security do you think the ones that are geared by security professionals are better than the ones that are geared by say people that are just teachers or are essentially just not teachers? <laughs> yeah, no, there's different degrees of, of information, right? So if, if you have a very technical certification, then you should have a technical person training you because they are the, the, the lead expert. If you have just a general person coming in who read a book and tells you what they, they read in that book, they're not helping you grow, right? Um, but at the same time, you need to have that general perspective into things. And so listening to other people talk about it and processing what they're saying and saying, okay, I've got the technical person's uh, information on this and I've kind of heard the generalist information on this. Where do I find myself? I, I think it's a good balance. But when you talk about getting those CPEs for certs, yeah, it should be a technical training. It should be because ultimately you should be able to walk out and prove that you know more than you did before you went in 
And otherwise, how can you say that you've learned any more for that certification? Sure. That's what you have to do is understand what they're being trained on outside, um, and what you're ultimately measuring there is the effectiveness of your outside trainer, right? And so, you do need to progress monitor that, and you need to get the information from your outside trainer as to what they're going to be training on, and hold them to that standard. So if, if they tell you that your employees are going to come back with this knowledge, okay, let's let's test my employees on that knowledge, and then. Based on that, if, if they're not achieving what they said they were supposed to achieve, then either I go back to the person who gave the training and say, look, you need to retool this, or I find somebody else. Sure. Where do you get the idea from the work of that friend? One of the things I always recommend to people is take the training that you just received. Mm -hmm. You sat here for six days and wrote an idea. Yep. Take it, go back to your office, sit down for 45 minutes with your head and your shoulders. Yep. It's a good approach, and the caveat I would say there is that you're, you could discourage people from getting training simply because they have that fear of talking about it to other people. So, although I think that's a great way of, you know, you, you learn by doing the idea that if you want to remember someone's phone number, you write it down, or you repeat it three times. You know, when I, when I meet you, I say your name three times because now I've ingrained that in my head. If I write it down three times, I can remember it. Um, <laughs> Again, see, there's, there's a trick, there's a general trick that doesn't work for everybody, right? Yeah, so I think it's a good idea, but at the same time, you don't want to discourage people from getting that technical training just because they think I have to come back and, and regurgitate it to the people. That's where the three tiers come in. So, yes, when you're progress monitoring, right, you, you put the student up through the, the system. At some point, you're going to say, okay, this isn't the teacher. This isn't the content. There's a, a real problem that the student is having. And it may not be that they're, they're not intelligent. It just may, may mean that the way they learn is very different than what you can actually give them. And so, yeah, there, there comes to that point in an educational system, that would be where you send them to the school psych at that point, have them test it, get that label, and then they can go to that specialized person. In a business environment, that third tier is real tricky because you're, you're not going to be able to impart all of the information on that person, right? But at least you've gone to a distance that you hadn't gone to before. Sure. I, I think some of that is just human interaction. I think when you sit down with a person and every time you try to impart the information, they glaze over. It may, again, it may be a learning issue, but it may just be that they're just disinterested. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you could apply it to any group of people, right? Um, I think, though, in a rephrase maybe of what you're saying is you could do that in an um, environment that the students or the people you're trying to teach don't understand that that's going on, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you need to progress monitor people you're training, but at the same time, then I should be pulled in and go through the same process behind the scenes, right? I mean, is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, or, that would be one way. Yeah, so you're talking, yeah, I mean, there's that general way, and, of course, you could lose status. But there's a way you could do it where you're pulling those instructors aside and saying, okay, now you go through the process that you're not degrading their status. Right, period, right. Right, sure. Or do it for yourself, that could work. 
<laughs> I know that's like, asking a lot. Crazy talk. Yeah, I think that's really an option. Yeah. Have you had a chance to apply in a security awareness program? And if so, how's it gone? I have not personally, no. And, and, and I know you're all like throwing daggers at me now. Oh, great, we just listened to you for an hour, and now you say you didn't even do it. The caveat, again, is that the information that I've imparted here, that I've tried to convey, is what I've actually watched my wife do. And I've sat in that process with her to see how she does it and to see how the feedback loop work. So I'm, I'm, I'm that guy that read the book but hasn't implemented yet, right? Sure. Um, and as Mercurial said right before this talk, eat your own dog food. And so, no, I haven't done it. But um, I would love to do something like this at some point in my life, yes. Um, I think I have a lot more to learn. So, um, but I'm just trying to get maybe even the general knowledge of it out there. I, I think almost every awareness program sucks in some way. That's kind of why I'm curious. How do we fix it? Is there an interesting idea? We can apply something that Mercurial just said an hour ago, which is if you don't know what to do, start with something and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. and, and that takes you back to progress monitoring. You know, if you, if you start with something and see how it goes, how do you know how it goes unless you're monitoring what you're doing? So, anything else? All right, well, I do have leftover cookies from this morning. So.